Hello, this is a video recording of the Introduction to Eco-Psychology seminar that was held earlier this week. Unfortunately, the recording of that, the live event, uh, the sound quality was, was very, very poor, and so I'm re-recording it now. And hopefully the sound quality will be better on this one than it was on the original. So for um, this particular seminar, we're going to have a look at uh, issues connected to eco-psychology, as, as you probably guessed from the title, um, in terms of defining what eco-psychology is and also environmental psychology, which is extremely similar but not absolutely the same as eco-psychology, in that eco-psychology tends to focus on the human relationship with the natural world. Uh, forests, fields, jungles, deserts, etc. Um, the relationship we have there, what it does to our minds, and uh, particularly in terms of therapeutic relationships, how we can um, heal emotional issues and difficulties and problems and, and psychological anxieties and so forth by communing with nature. Environmental psychology does include that, but it's also um, quite significantly interested in the relationship between the human mind and the built environment, that is to say, the environment which we human beings create for ourselves, homes and workplaces, hospitals, libraries, schools, colleges, uh, factories, etc. So how do we utilize space? How do we relate to space? Which is where it sort of shades into an element of sociology as well on that front. And also what impact does the built environment have on the human state of mind? Are there places which are uplifting and inspiring and, and support a, a fully functioning state of mind? Are there other environments which are deleterious to the mind, which have a negative impact on the state of mind? So there's elements of that. So we'll look at both of those as we go along and a little bit of background um, history to understand where um, this has come from. But the quote here from Robert Greenway, who was a big name, um, suitably enough with a surname like Greenway, in eco-psychology, who described it thus. Eco-psychology is a search for language to describe the human and nature relationship. It is a tool for better understanding the relationship for diagnosing what is wrong with that relationship and for suggesting paths to healing. So the emphasis there is on healing and therapy and restoration of a harmonious state of mind. <coughs> the element at the start of that quote about the search for language, we could go off into various philosophical um, avenues around Wittgenstein and uh, discussions of language games. Um, we won't go too far down that route because we want to keep the focus on psychology rather than, <coughs> excuse me, on philosophy. But the, the two subjects do overlap to some extent. Uh, Wittgenstein was one of a number of philosophers to talk about the extent to which language reflects ideas, concepts, notions, perceptions, and as notions and perceptions expand into new areas, we can often lack a language to describe those experiences, those ideas, those understandings. And if you're trying to communicate with another human being, you want them to understand what you mean, and they want to understand what you mean, then you need a commonality of language. You need some shared phrases, terms, words, ideas, so that they can get what you're trying to talk about. The science fiction author Robert Heinlein used this term grok, to grok somebody, to, to actually get, not simply to understand at a, a dry intellectual level, but to emotionally get what they really mean by the concepts that they're describing, by the language that they're using. And that's essentially what Greenway is trying to get at here, that possibly hundreds or thousands of years ago, we might have had words and terms and phrases to describe the psychological impact of different environmental conditions and states, the experience of, of walking in a forest, the experience of being out under moonlight and hearing the wolves howl in the distance, the experience of being on a seashore when there's a storm looking up, the experience of climbing to the top of a mountain, all of those very, very different experiences. There may have been language and words and terms to describe those in long distant times, but by and large in English, which was Greenway's primary language, um, we no longer have such terms, if we ever had them in the first place. And so this search for language 
is not simply a language so that academics can talk about academic subjects to each other. It's also so that everybody can talk about and explain and convey the nature of their experiences in wilderness locations and other places too, both the good and the bad and the indifferent experiences that they're having in those locations. And, and certainly when Greenway was writing back in the 90s, he felt there was not at that time a sufficiently developed language to describe these experiences. It was something that eco-psychologists amongst others should be working on to develop and to convey to other people. Uh, have we got that language yet in 2021? <sighs> Not really. <laughs> it's a simple answer to that. It's still a, a project being worked upon, something to be developed, to, to, to have a sense of how we convey our experiences, our understandings, our um, joys and sufferings as they are related to the environment around us and inspired by the environment around us. Um, we will briefly uh, stray into more philosophical areas. I'll, I'll try not to get too abstractly theological on this one, but it, it's difficult not to include at least some um, element of theology and philosophy in these explorations because the roots of a lot of these ideas that are prominent in eco-psychology trace themselves back to earlier philosophical movements and earlier still religious movements. So there is a, a very decided overlap between these um, areas of study. Nietzsche was not the first person to talk about the Apollonian and the Dionysian experiences, but he certainly popularized them in a way that earlier writers had not done. Now, Apollo and Dionysus were two ancient Greek gods uh, Nietzsche, like many highly educated men of his generation, and indeed highly educated women of his generation, was very inspired by the ancient Greeks, had an understanding of, of the classics and, and Greek religion, Greek philosophy, Greek um, mythology, and how that can shape our understanding of human existence. We find exactly the same thing, of course, with Sigmund Freud, who was absolutely fascinated by Greek myth and used the language, we're back to that idea again, using a language, using the language of Greek myth to convey his insights into the human mind, into the human psyche. Nietzsche, somewhat earlier than Freud, was describing these concepts in terms of Apollo and Dionysus. And as you've got the image on the slide there, Apollo on the left, Dionysus on the right, Apollo, the god of light, of radiance, of sun, of rationality, of artistry, of music and healing. Uh, Nietzsche developed this a little bit more, kind of layering on top of it things that were not necessarily present in the thought systems and the beliefs of the ancient Greeks, but sort of adding his own flavor, his own nuance on top of this, where he describes Apollo as the intellectual function the, um, the, the kind of civilizing function, the aspiration function of classical thought of building towards society and civilization, bearing in mind that um, the, the very word civilization comes from Latin and the root for city, the civilized people were the people who lived in the cities and by, by default the uncivilized, the, the rural were those who lived in villages, in the sort of what to the the Roman mind or the Athenian mind might have been considered the back of beyond. Uh, and so there was this very distinct line being drawn partly by the ancients themselves and then heavily emphasized by Nietzsche between those who lived in very built up, very large scale, very dense environments with, with large populations, lots and lots of buildings and roads and factories and all manner of, of highly technocratic living environments on the one hand and those living much more technologically simpler lives, fewer buildings, fewer roads, fewer services in the countryside. Um, in Nietzsche's lifetime there was um, more rural area than there is these days where we, we see a lot of villages getting built up and built up and then they kind of 
converge with each other and you get small towns and the towns turn into bigger towns and then into cities uh, and, and so a lot of rural life has been eaten up by the expansion of cities these days which haven't um, happened to quite such an extent in Nietzsche's lifetime. The Dionysian um, Dionysus was the god of alcohol, wine, women and song, the god of partying, the god of celebration, the god of joy, um, ecstatic joy, frenzied joy, a joy that dissolves boundaries. Uh, when Freud came to talk about this, he, he was looking at the idea that the, the ego uh, creates boundaries, creates definitions, creates a sense of contained self. But this dark, for what uh, Freud was the id, that, that sort of wild, primordial sense of self that's there from infancy, that dissolves boundaries, tears down boundaries. Just as if Apollo is the, uh, the building and Dionysus is the ivy tearing that building down into rubble. So the, these two forces which uh, for Nietzsche exist within the human psyche, and it's always important to remember, easy to forget, but important to remember with Nietzsche that he emphasised that human nature contains both and must have both. You cannot obliterate one and have only the other. You must have both Apollo, the logical, the rational, the, the left brain, the intellectual, and Dionysus, the passionate, the, the dramatic, the emotional, the right brain, the creative, the, the force that dissolves what Apollo builds up, because too much of one or too much of the other leads to a very, very unhealthy imbalanced state. So there always has to be an element of both. Um, if it's not already obvious how this relates to eco-psychology, uh, Levi Strauss, who had a huge impact on anthropology, um, psychology, sociology, a whole raft of disciplines he had a big impact on. Uh, Levi Strauss talks about this idea that um, going back to ancient times, humanity has existed, uh, developed in largely rural conditions, very small communities, sometimes nomadic, eventually, usually settling down into villages, but living in large scale wilderness areas. Humanity saw nature is really quite frightening. If you go back to ancient times, that uh, somebody who was went off by themselves, let's say 1500 years ago or 2000 years ago, who went off by themselves for a nice long hike in the woods, might easily end up being eaten by bears or wolves or, or having lumps chewed off them by wild boar. They might fall down a ravine and, and just lay there until they died. Nature was not a forgiving condition. Back before we had rescue helicopters and um, mobile phones to call for help and hospitals to patch up our wounds if we became injured and, and those wounds might become infected. Nature for the farmer was a force to be almost battled with. The, the, the constant worry about bad weather, about locusts, about crop disease, about all manner of things that could wipe out a harvest and then not only bankrupt that individual farmer, but lead to mass starvation in the local community. People would die during a bad harvest if there wasn't enough food to go, go around. So worries about nature were very, very real. And of course, whilst some of us sit in nice, cosy urban environments, like the one I'm sitting in at the moment, sort of insulated from the world around us, to this very day in many, many, many parts of the world, vast numbers of people still live in exactly those conditions where a bad harvest is the difference between eating and starving. Where, may, yes, there are hospitals and so on around, but the, the length of time it would take to get to a hospital to have your injuries packed up probably means that you'll be dead before you get there. And so people learn to have a great deal more respect, shall we say, for nature as a source of danger, as a source of threat, rather than seeing it as this lovely um, bucolic thing that you can go frolicking in the woods and have a smashing all the time, looking at the daisies and the daffodils and the butterflies, and it's almost like a, a holiday venue, which perhaps to some extent is where um, eco-psychology has a tendency to err uh, on the side of rosy spectacles, to, to sort of venerate nature as this glorious antidote to the awfulness of urban living, which 
for people in the ancient world, they might have seen it very much the other way around, if anything, that nature was risky and dangerous and, and uh, a source of injury and harm, and that being in a city was something to aspire to. Think indeed of many people around the world today in terms of migration patterns who perhaps are migrating from um, isolated rural communities which may be subject to famine and, and earthquakes and uh, warfare and, and various problems in different countries around the world. Where do they want to move to when they migrate, when they flee their countries? Do they want to go and live in quiet rural communities? By and large, no. Most of them want to go and live in cities. There is a tendency to, to see cities as a place where you can get jobs, where you can get money, you can get security, you can get a house, you can get regular food on the table, you can get me medical treatment when you need it. You're not living 300 miles from the nearest hospital with the likelihood that you'll die before you ever get there. So the view of nature as something glorious and wonderful is, we could argue, a view held by modern day city dwellers who have this very um, rosy view of the natural world as, as a place of beauty and harmony and, and peace and very sort of um, joyous bucolic atmosphere which is not necessarily the way those humans who live cheek by jowl with it tend to view it so there's a, there's a bit of an issue going on here. But uh, for Levi Strauss, um, nature can be, has been perceived in a more Dionysian way as this dark, chaotic, frightening place, the, the, the wilderness full of dangerous beasts and wild weather and, and diseases and, and all manner of threats. And city life, or at least town life, urban life, if not a large scale city, at least a town, is more Apollonian, peaceful, orderly, structured, regulated. Now, of course, we know, those of us who have lived in cities, know that cities are not all wonderful and glorious, that they come with their own risks. Um, maybe you no longer have to worry about being eaten by a pack of wolves or a bear, but you are certainly worrying about being knifed by a mugger or killed by someone in search of their next fix. So that there's other worries that come with big scale urban living, but everything has its upside and its downside in that sense. Um, Camille Paglia, who was mentioned on the slide there, we'll, we'll just mention her very briefly because her main area of interest is art history. Although she's also very well known as a social commentator um, uh, and certainly a name that crops up a lot in sociology, more so than in psychology. But she runs with the idea of the distinction between Apollo and Dionysius, but she expands it into various other directions, which may be of interest to some of you. Um, she's got a lot to say on issues around gender and sexuality, and that the kind of um, distinctions between um, Apollo, which she sees as more sort of um, homosexual gay, and Dionysius, which she sees as more heterosexual um, straight, and the sort of the, the, the tensions, but, and, and tensions between the demands of the body and the demands of the mind, between the cerebral and the physical. And some of this she relates to medieval Christianity and, and the dichotomies of the early church, which had its Manichaean heresy, um, which she was constantly trying to pull away from. But uh, the Manichaean heresy was the um, tendency to see the, the spiritual world, the abstract higher world, the mental world, the intellectual world, as as the only true good world and anything connected to the body, to the senses, to the passions, um, sex and food and sleep and comfort and, and tiredness uh, and you know, anything physical as of the devil, as being corrupted and wicked and, and leading the mind astray. And certainly there were traditions within the church that um, in medieval times that tended to dichotomize this um, and, and often in gender terms to see the male as naturally more intellectual and cerebral and the female as naturally more physical and sensual and, and Dionysian. And this is something that Parlia is interested in, the way in which these things have become um, 
barriers. Rather than seeing them as two sides of a single coin, they've become seen as forces at, at war with each other. Um, over the course of history, it's led to horrific levels of um, violence and abuse and persecution and all, all manner of really quite grim things over the course of um, not simply Western history, but history in other parts of the world too. And part of that for Palia is also this tendency to demonize the the natural world as well as to demonize the feminine mother nature indeed to see it as a threat and a risk and a, a, a source of monstrousness a source of corruption and sin and wickedness rather than as a sort of inspiration source as a which he regards as, as an idea more common in the ancient world than in the medieval world um, the veneration of nature um, in a respectful way but with a wariness for its dangers but a, a, a veneration of it nonetheless so that the overlap between religion and politics and art and theology and ordinary day-to-day -day human relationships how men and women relate to each other how um, people relate within themselves to the different aspects of their own psyche she sees this as panning out in all sorts of different directions and there's a whole massive subject of discussion there in and of itself uh, Freud, as we already mentioned, picked up on these concepts quite extensively. He talks about the idea of the superego, the, the um, moral conscience that develops, or at least it can develop with the right input from parents, uh, which is a sense of control, of order, of regulation, a desire for structure, a desire for cleanliness. Not exactly the same things that Nietzsche was talking about, but it has an overlap with Nietzsche's concepts of the Apollonian and um, Freud also mentioned the id earlier he talks about the id this dark impulsive um, driven uh, primitive sense of self that's with us from infancy in which we demand we want something we demand it in the instant we're hungry we want to be fed we're tired we want to go to sleep we need to go to the loo so we do so without waiting to to find the facilities so that the baby who um, wets their nappy or whatever, it's instant gratification, instant release. There's no waiting, there's no, um, as adults, that, as we do where well, we have to keep our legs crossed until we can find a toilet, there's none of that. It's I want it, I must have it, I will do it now. That's the id. And that, again, it's not exactly the same as what Nietzsche is talking about with the Dionysian impulse, but it has a lot of overlap with that nonetheless. So there, there is a, a, an element there playing out in Freud's argument. And again, the body tends to be seen, Freud's argument, that the, the superego learns what is acceptable in polite society and what is not acceptable in polite society. Bearing in mind that Freud lived through the Victorian and the Edwardian eras, um, dying in 1939. So he lived through a period of history in which a lot of the things regarded as improper for polite society and polite conversation were often physical things of the body. And concerns around um, you know, not talking about certain subjects, not engaging in, um, how, how can we put this politely, physical displays of various sorts were considered improper. There are things to be done behind closed doors in private, not in front of other people. Um, and so there was a stigmatization of that. Um, for Freud, the stigmatization of the body is not just your own body, it's the stigmatization of other people's bodies and by extension, the stigmatization of nature is a source of mess and filth and threat and, and problem. Uh, Jung builds upon a similar idea where he talks about the shadow self, the, the, the dark side, which is both internal to us as individuals, but also shared at a collective level with the culture in which we are brought up. So um, you know, there, there is a cultural shadow, a cultural dark side of things that are considered inappropriate, impolite, vulgar, crass, rude, indeed wicked, evil, all sorts of levels of things that must be kept within the shadows rather than talked about openly and discussed politely. And the sense of self, of who I am, is very much like uh, Freud's notion of the ego, the, the ego, if you prefer, or um, that sense of Apollonian self, the, 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 the rational, the logical, the sensible, the aspirational self, 
that is presented in the public light to other people. The light of Apollo. Um, Eric Fromm was a, another um, psychologist, um, slightly later period. He survived the concentration camps of the Second World War um, uh, and uh, lived to write extensively about his experiences and it shaped his understanding of therapies. He, he was a very prominent psychologist. Um, not as well known these days as he deserves to be. He, he has an awful lot of interesting things to say which are still very, very relevant in the 21st century. Well, we won't go over all of the things he had to say because it's, it covers too broad an area, but he spoke about two big concepts which are worth noting, and it continues this theme of Apollo and Dionysus, and our relationship to our own bodies and our relationship to the world around us. He spoke of two personality types, the Biophilus and the Necrophilus. The Biophilus from the Greek meaning to love life, and Necrophilus also from the Greek meaning to love death. Um, to love life is to have joy in life, in your own existence, in the existence of the others around you, other people, cats, dogs, horses, budgies, trees, etc. To enjoy a walk in the woods and, and the song of the birds and, and the buzz of the bees, to find that joyful and uplifting and... and, and not simply reassuring, but inspirational to find it the kind of thing that moves you to art and poetry and music. And that also is part of the Biophilus personality, someone who loves to create. Now there's a thousand and one ways in which people can create. It could be composing songs, it could be baking cakes, it could be embroidery, it could be um, those colouring in books that were very popular a while ago. It, it could be a whole raft of different ways in which we create. And it's not, incidentally, important to note, it's not about being good at creating. It doesn't mean that you have to be the next Michelangelo or, or the next Vivaldi or whatever. You, your art and your music and your cakes could be a bit, frankly, a bit rubbish. It doesn't matter. The point is that you enjoy creating it. So even if your cakes are burnt and your music is a bit out of key and your artwork is a bit kind of stick figures, that doesn't matter. It's the fact that you like to create, you enjoy it, you relish it, you, you express yourself. That's the key thing of the Biophilus personality, is the joy of expression. The joy of being in the moment. Uh, if you own a dog, you'll, you'll understand that dogs exist very much in the moment. They don't spend all day moping about what they said a month ago or did a month ago. They don't sit there dreading tomorrow. They live in the moment. And the Biophilus personality is very much in the joy of the moment. doesn't mean you have to be naive about the future or the past, but you enjoy being here and now, today. To be with people you love, to, to enjoy good companionship, whether that's the companionship of your dog, your cat, your horse, your family, your friends, whoever, to be with the people around you and to want the best for them. Which, if anyone's unfamiliar with the, the word, can... Confelicity on the slide there. Um, confelicity means to take happiness in other people's joys and successes. So you see somebody else achieving something, a, a, you know, a good outcome of some description or another, and you're happy for them. You're not envious, you're not jealous, you're not bitter and resentful. You are happy that they are happy. Which is a bit of a, um, well, from worried that it was a bit of a rare quality. He wanted to see more of it in the world. Now, by contrast, there is the necrophilus personality, the person who comes to love death and destruction. Uh, and this, uh, I know obviously you have movements like that, sort of uh, goths and so on, who like dressing in a very funereal style. He wasn't really thinking about that, although goths weren't a thing as such in Fromm's lifetime. That's not really what he meant. It's, it's the love of, of destroying, of, of tearing apart, of hurting, of um, taking satisfaction in other people's miseries. The, the term Schadenfreude uh, is a German word for someone who enjoys seeing other people have accidents, be hurt, experience loss and distress of some sort. So um, you know, the old thing that somebody slips on a banana skin and, and uh, everyone laughs. Well, at least that's what they used to do in the old 
black and white films with Charlie Chaplin and what have you, um, to, to laugh at somebody else's misfortune is schadenfreude. And it, it's not necessarily because it's someone you don't like. It could be somebody you've, who's a total stranger to you, but nonetheless you laugh at their misfortune. Um, quite, quite a common reaction. Um, uh, and for Eric Fromm, maybe a little bit too common. Uh, something he wanted to see less of in the world. Just as the Biophilus personality relishes um, happiness and joy and laughter and, and, uh, and so forth, the Necrophilus person likes to watch suffering. They like to see um, people hurt. They Maybe they enjoy inflicting the hurt directly themselves in a sadistic act, or they may simply enjoy watching it. Um, blood and sweat and guts and toil and suffering. You could think all the way back to the ancient Roman gladiatorial arena of watching two warriors hack and slash at each other or watching people being fed to the lions or, or whatever sort of excesses and gratuitous events might have been taking place there to see someone screaming in pain and bleeding and dying and laugh at it, enjoy it. Um, all the way through to those kind of modern day TV shows where there is a, a positive thrill in watching someone some of these talent shows, for example, where somebody makes really unpleasant, catty, spiteful remarks about somebody else's lack of talent. And it's not done in a, in a sort of constructive criticism way to help them improve their, their singing or dancing or, or whatever the talent may be. It's out of sheer cattiness. And the other person is clearly upset and offended and the, the camera lingers on their upset and their embarrassment and their humiliation. That's the, the kind of thing that um, Fromm was describing, this love of destruction. I'm trying to link this back in case you're wondering what the hell this has got to do with eco-psychology. The Biophilus person loves to walk in the woods, to hear the bird song, to see the squirrels running up the trees. The Necrophilus person would be more interested in chainsawing the trees down and turning it into a supermarket car park would take no value, no joy in that landscape, but would be thinking, well, if I got rid of this, what could I have instead that would make me money, that would bring me a profit, that would bring me an advantage? And it's not simply a money-making mentality, because money doesn't have to come into the picture. It's just that they, they see no value in life in and of itself. It's um, the only value land has is what they could do with it next. Or maybe they, they take excitement in the thought of starting a forest fire. Uh, and you get the pyromaniac who loves to watch things burn. So they don't want to walk in the woods, they want to send light to the woods. It's that kind of love of destruction, that um, urge. And obviously having said earlier that Eric Fromm survived the concentration camps, Clearly he saw the most extreme examples of people who loved to kill and maim and destroy and terrorise. Whether it was bricking the windows of the local synagogue or whether it was shoveling vast numbers of people into gas chambers. Or all of the stages in between. To cause misery and suffering and hurt and enjoy it. To feel a sense of power, a sense of of um, accomplishment by causing misery and suffering. And this is a, a key point, it may not sound as if this is much to do with trees and plants and so forth, but the key point here which Fromm is making when he talks about the, the sort of two personality types is that contempt for a fellow human being will spill over into contempt for other animals, will spill over into a contempt for the wider environment. And so rather than seeing the, the lovely river flowing past and thinking, oh, I'll go and have a swim in that or, or paddle in it or whatever, the, the individual just sees somewhere to lob their empty drinks bottle or you know, chuck a load of other rubbish into the river and let it wash away. They've got no interest in the river at all except as a means to serve some rather selfish end and the necrophilus personality is very very selfish uh, another point that Schrom makes is that um, whilst the the sadist may gain 
very short-term pleasure from battering someone, inflicting misery on them in some way. The necrophilus person cannot make other people happy, nor can they make themselves happy in the long term. They may get a short-term thrill from hurting an individual, but they don't experience happiness. People are not born necrophilus, they're born biophilus, they become warped and damaged by their environment and make poor choices. So this is not entirely an argument for saying some poor little flower has been damaged by the environment and it's not their fault, it's all fault of, of the world around them. Fromm was not letting people off the hook to that extent. He said, yes, you do get damaged by the environment you grew up in, but you also have your own free will, your own agency to make choices. And if you consistently keep making poorer and poorer and poorer choices, you go down a darker and darker, slippery, slippery slope, and you become inch by inch more and more necrophilus until it gets to the point where it's very difficult for you to turn back. Not impossible. There is still that capacity to to change, to be redeemed, if you want to put it into religious terms. There is still the capacity to become a better person, if you want to, but you've got to want to. And clearly, the, the deeper into a pit you sink, the more effort it takes to climb out of that pit. Uh, so we start as biophilus individuals, but we, a sizable chunk of us, become necrophilus. Still a minority. Uh, Fromm felt it was a minority of people, but they were a very, very destructive minority of people who caused a hell of a lot of chaos. And if you have an interest in criminology and crime, um, you'll find plenty of police officers who will tell you that in any given neighbourhood, a massive chunk of crime can be tracked back to the same small number of individuals. So if there's a hundred burglaries in your town in a year, it might turn out that 85 of them were carried out by the same person. Because when it comes to issues like that, one individual becomes a, a, a kind of a tidal wave of misery around them. So it's not that there's a hundred burglaries and a hundred burglars, but rather one person causing a hell of a lot of misery and then a few others on the periphery. Same with sex offences, the same with a lot of crimes. Um, it's a small number of people causing a lot of suffering. Uh, the, the concept on the slide there, giving shafts gefühle, um, is not, not a term that Eric Fromm invented. It's a, a, a combination of pre-existing words in the German language. But Eric Fromm takes this as an idea, runs with it and builds on it and says, being a, a therapist, a counsellor, advising people with problems, you can't really help the unhappy unless you've got a very clear understanding of what a healthy state of mind is. Because how do you know someone is damaged unless you know what they would look like if they were healthy? And the job of a therapist is to take the damaged person and move them towards a state of, of better health, mental health, physical health, etc. Um, so you need this concept of good health, and Gemeinschaftsgefühle is that concept of good health, of positive health. And it's not just health of the body, it's health of the mind, health of the, the spirit, if you like, to have this joy in life, this relishing of all things that are good and wonderful and happy, to, to skip in the woods, to do all the things that the biophilus person does, to create, to express, to love, to look after, to share, to nurture, to want the best for the people around you. Even when those people can be very difficult people, very awkward, challenging people, you still want, by and large, most of the time at any rate, you want them to get better. You would like to see them improve rather than be destroyed. Maybe there are occasions when, when exceptions are made to that rule, but by and large, it's the wish for other people's happiness and goodness and contentment, rather than the wish for suffering and misery and despair. Uh, and the, the enjoyment of life. So giving Schaftsgefühle is a state not confined to an individual. So it's not just in one person's mind that they have a state of giving Schaftsgefühle. Rather, it's a shared collective experience with lots of people of that state of mind coming together to create a society. And this is where it tips over into elements of sociology as well as psychology. To have that state of shared living 
where we enable other people to also have joyful, happy existences. And not just other humans, but cats and dogs and horses and parrots and, and goldfish and, and so forth. We enable the world around us to be joyful and living. And if society existed in the state of Geminschaftsgefühle, it would look very different from the way it did in Eric Fromm's lifetime and I think from the way it does in my lifetime. So far, at any rate, um, in that we would embrace the capacity for people to have more freedom, to, to not be so exhausted and worn out and downtrodden from excessive workloads that all they, they have the time to do is work and sleep. We'd want to design society in such a way that people have the time, the energy, the mental capacity to go for walks in the woods, to bake cakes, to visit their loved ones, to paint pictures, to, to do whatever it is that they do to make themselves happy and joyful. We would um, have prison systems, probably much smaller prison systems than we do, which would focus on rehabilitation rather than punishment, which would focus on making people better citizens than when they arrived. We'd have schools and colleges and universities which focused on bringing out creativity and human connection and contact and a love of learning rather than um, just jumping through hoops and having um, league tables and, and attainment levels and, and so forth. It would be a very different focus to how we lived. Things like town planning would be very different. There'd be a lot more green spaces because for Gemin Shafsifula, a major feature of being happy is to be out in nature. Uh, and so you wouldn't have massive urban environments like London and Manchester and Leeds and places like that. You'd have much, much greener environments with lots of parks and places where you could go and see wild animals not i don't mean zoos but animals just living free you'd, you'd have um, more places for creativity um, places for music places for art places for dance for for other forms of creativity for shared coming together and living and people doing things because they're fun not because there's a profit to be had or, or careers to be built or fame to be attained, but because it's fun. So it would have a, a lot more of a joyful light society. Um, within the sphere of wider ecological theory, Murray Bookchin talks about social ecology. He's coming from a very left-wing point of view. Um, Gemin Schafskefühle is not a specifically left-wing, right-wing or any other kind of wing point of view, it's I suppose politically neutral in a sense, um, but Bookchin again talks about this idea of redesigning the whole of society and that to benefit the environment it's not just a case of park planting trees and picking litter, uh, it's a case of overhauling the whole of society in such a way that people would be happier, have more freedoms and that happy people are less destructive, they're more caring and sharing and considerate, they don't go around chucking their rubbish in rivers, they don't go around torturing puppies to death, they don't go around doing awful dreadful things because they're happy. It's only miserable people who do miserable things. Not everyone agrees with her, but it's a point of view shared not just by Eric Fromm but by others as well. Now on the slide there you've got various uh, therapeutic techniques, there are way more than I've put on the slide, this is just a small soup song of ways in which eco-psychology uh, develops and um, promotes techniques of um, healing people emotionally, psychologically, of their assorted problems and issues by engaging with the natural world in various different capacities. Um, some of this is better researched than others in terms of uh, testing the effectiveness. It, it's easy, there's a lot of therapies that are suggested but there's very little research to work at to, to find out do they actually make people better at a, a significant rate or are they just a bit of old snake oil psychologists are interested in doing the background research to find out do these things actually make people better and some of these are better are quite well supported by that sort of research other therapeutic techniques not quite so much at least not yet you know, room for research to be conducted but to give you the five examples on the screen, um, gardening therapy is pretty much what it sounds like. 
It's getting people out, usually as a community rather than as individuals, um, gardening, weeding, planting, pruning, doing all the usual things that gardeners do, getting their hands dirty in the soil, taking care of watching plants grow, nurturing them, listening to the birds coming to the garden, watching the, the insects and the snails and the various uh, creatures that come to uh, well-tended garden areas. So, it, uh, And the idea that doing that on an ongoing basis is beneficial. There's quite a lot of mental health charities that engage in gardening therapy with considerable success in terms of lowering anxiety rates, lowering self-harm rates, that sort of thing, as people generally, generally feel much better for ongoing. Uh, this is not a one-off thing. You do an hour of gardening and you feel instantly better. It's not that. You spend months and months gardening and you watch the garden in summer and autumn and winter and spring and you see the changing of the seasons. And that ongoing, li lifelong, potentially, engagement with gardening, particularly with uh, if you do it with other people, so there's a bit of banter, you can stop and have a coffee break and you can help each other and so on, is that shared experience of both the positive human environment and the positive natural environment that are therapeutic. Wilderness therapy is going off for a hike in the woods, which is easier to do in some countries where they have massive forests. We're, we're rather short on that in Britain because we've devastated so much of our natural landscape. But you know, camping out for a few days or a week or however long, and um, not sometimes with other people, sometimes just doing it alone to, to get away from you know, mobile phones and laptops and constant pressure of being here and doing this and having deadlines and all the rest of it too, to just be off out you get up when you like, you wander around, go where you like, paddle in the rivers, climb a mountain, sit under a tree, watch the deer run past, do whatever it is that the wind takes you at the time and to just enjoy being out in nature. Uh, animal therapy uh, is, is getting quite extensively used these days in a variety of different contexts. Um, it's, it's usually pet therapy, dogs, cats, etc. Bringing them into retirement homes so that elderly people who probably used to have pets before they were um, put into the retirement home can just hug a dog or stroke a cat. Um, sometimes taking animals into hospitals or into schools, more, more so colleges. Um, so, and we have used that at West Suffolk College on a number of occasions, particularly around exam time when students are getting very anxious and stressed. That um, dog therapy, having a pen with um, friendly dogs in it and, and students can come and, or staff even, can come and sit with the dogs and stroke them and pat them and you know, play with them and roll a ball with them and all the rest of it. It is beneficial and there have been plenty of studies done showing um, lowered blood pressure rates, uh, a slowing down of heart rate, a dropping of cortisol levels, a, a lifting of oxytocin levels in the brain which are associated with, with feeling well, feeling good. Cortisol is more associated with feeling stressed. So when that lowers, it's a sign that somebody is relaxing. Um, so there's a variety of contexts, uh, dogs, cats, horses, all, all, all sorts of different animals which um, socialise with, engage with humans, where it's it's just fun to be with them uh, and to be in the moment with them. Sentry gardens are used um, reasonably extensively, um, particularly with people who are, are blind or deaf or, or have other um, senses uh, I, I, either partial, you know, partially sighted for example or completely absent where the gardens are designed and planted in such a way to emphasize other senses that the individual still has. So, you know, the, the blind person might go to a, a garden which has a lot of very scented flowers so that they, 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 they gain the pleasure even if they can't see the flowers they gain the pleasure of inhaling them um, the tactile gardens are a very common one with, with different shapes and forms and structures and plants and trees and so forth chosen to give lots of changing types of, of sensory environment that individuals can engage with in different ways. Uh, forest bathing is an idea from uh, Japan which has emerged out of the Shinto religion which is a, um, the, the primary or most, most popular religion in terms of subscribers. Uh, devotees in Japan which puts a lot of emphasis on the natural world 
Um, forest bathing is going out into the woods and meditating, just sitting, resting. So whereas wilderness therapy, you're going for a hike, you're camping for a number of days. Um, forest bathing is, is perhaps for a few hours, sitting under a tree, listening to the wind and the, the creak of the branches and the song of the birds and just leaning against an old tree and inhaling the aromas of the forest floor and forgetting the pressures of work. Um, Japan has a remarkably high suicide rate linked to workplace pressures. Um, and so it's getting away from all that and, and just immersing in the, in the forest. I'm sure you could do it in other, you, you could probably have cave bathing or seashore bathing or whatever. So it, it's not only forest, it could work, I'm sure, as well in other types of um, natural location that people might wish to engage in. So, and there's a lot of other types of therapy too, which are developed within eco-psychology. Um, the term on the slide there, some of you may be unfamiliar with, of salutogenic um, factors. A salutogenic factor is a factor that sustains good health. And a critique made by some um, psychologists, um, Aronson and others, is that psychology, particularly therapeutic psychology, tends to be very heavily focused on pathogenesis, what causes people to be ill, which is, that's what pathogenesis means, or focusing on the causes of illness and distress and, and uh, mental illnesses and so forth. Um, that is a one-sided approach, is the argument. And it's in keeping with Eric Fromm's idea of focusing on the positive or, or on the healthy states of mind. Salutogenesis says that, you know, what causes you to be healthy? Not just what causes you to be ill, but what causes you to be healthy? What keeps someone happy? What keeps them healthy? What keeps them calm? What keeps them functioning well in life? What are those factors? And arguably spending time in nature, certainly from an eco-psychological point of view, is a major part of that. Does everyone have access to that? Well, we found out very, very prominently, as if we didn't know already, during the COVID lockdown, periods that whilst it was all well and good for for the middle classes to go and, and um, work from home and sit in the garden and, and chill out there there's a hell of a lot of people living in high-rised flats and, and a kind of a, um, housing of that nature where they don't have gardens if they're lucky they might have a window box but that's about it there might be a park that they could go to but you know, in lockdown that becomes problematic in and of itself um, those parks are not always necessarily well kept and often they become the venues for crime and people passing out drunk or stoned or, or whatever. Um, so they're not always safe places to go. Because, uh, going back to Eric Fromm, if the world were operating along the, the guidelines of Gemenschaftsky Fühler, we wouldn't be putting them, putting people in high-rise flats in the first place. We would be designing housing in such a way that everyone could have access to garden space that every town and village and city would have plenty of parks where people could go to and those parks would be well maintained and there would be safe venues to go to and they'd have benches for people who need to wreck you can't walk too far who need to pause and rest there'd be plenty of benches for them to sit on and just enjoy the the trees and the flowers and the birds and the rest of it so we would redesign the world in such a way that it was green uh, and that's something that's become very prominent. Whether as a society we do a damn thing about this in the years to come, I've got no idea. Um, will we start redesigning towns and cities to be greener environments, to increase the amount of garden space for individuals, the amount of park space and access to, to kind of, and not just instantly um, nice, neat, managed parks with orderly flower beds, but also it's important from Fromm's argument that we have places that are as close to wilderness as you can get them, that are not main, main, well, from a crime point of view, so you don't have people passing out drunk in them, yes, but um, places where you can go and see wild animals, rather than everything being neat and structured and orderly and maintained the way a lot of parks tend to be. So it's all important to have both those kind of environments available because both are salutogenic. Both are required for the good health of the mind. Um, 
There's been other forms of research. So the um, mention there of Ulrich back in the 80s and um, Ulrich's research, which covered a whole raft of areas, actually uh, did a lot of research. Um, one of them was into recovery rates of hospital patients. Um, some patients were sitting in, well, in their beds were in front of a window so they could look out the hospital window and see a few trees and a few birds fly past and what have you. And other people, their hospital beds were facing a wall. So all they could see were the other patients in the hospitals and the war. Um, the people who could see out windows were found were recovering quicker than the people who were staring at walls. So having not even they couldn't go into the gardens, they couldn't get outside of their hospital beds. But even just being able to see it was enough in the first place to have a, a therapeutic effect on them and to speed up their rates of recovery, which also obviously has economic implications for, in this country, the NHS. The quicker people get better, the less money they cost, generally speaking. So even for people who are not desperately concerned about environmental issues, maybe they will take on board the economic factors and that will um, inspire a wish to take on board these, these kinds of concerns to um, improve recovery rates. So there's also been studies around things like the, the colour of hospital walls. Uh, some colours have a more therapeutic effect than others in terms of rates of recovery. Now one thing to flag up, we won't go too much down this line because it would be too easy to turn this into a philosophy seminar rather than a psychology seminar, but we've spoken a lot about nature as forests, fields, mountains, so forth. Um, places that are out there and if you live in a, in a city or you live in a town then to get to the woods, to get to the seashore, to get to the mountainside, you normally have to travel. And so nature becomes a journey away. And there is this risk that we externalise nature, we get so used to talking about nature as out there, that we forget that nature is right here, that human beings are part of the natural world. It's not just dogs and cats and zebras and elephants and blue whales. We are animals in the natural world too. We are a part of it. Birds build nests, ants build mounds, we create houses. This is part of our manifestation as what we do, what our species does. And so we have to have the understanding that nature is here and now and we are part of it. We are not outside of it, even though we often act as if we are. But we, we are not outside of it. We are directly impacted by nature every minute of every day. And we need to factor that into things like town planning, to things like our daily lives, what we do, where we go, how we live, how we engage, how we respond to the world around us and so forth. Um, if we treat it uh, nature as just this thing we go to for a visit, then the, the concern within eco-psychology is that nature becomes a therapy, almost like a holiday trip. Or I'm going to go to the woods and, and forest bathe. So I go to nature, I, I get my therapy from it and I come back home. And somehow my home is not nature. That's not, that, that's, prob that's a problematic form of thinking. It's a very split form of thinking, a dichotomous form of thinking in which we fail to integrate the fact that our homes are part of the natural world too. And our homes can have, even if you live in a flat, you can have potted plants. You can have nature within your home. Uh, and and you can, the, the green and the growing can be part of any house. Um, so that there, there's, by rethinking how we understand what nature is, i.e. that nature is everything around us, including our homes and our cities and our, our towns and our villages and all the rest of it. All of that is a part of nature too. It, it perhaps starts to change how we think about the world around us and our relationship to it, our engagement with it. So uh, yeah. nature is not just lions and tigers, it's pet cats and pet dogs and pet gerbils and, and the birds that perch in the trees outside are all part of nature, the, the insects, everything is part of nature. But it's, it, it's not just about seeing it as a thing to visit, it's in the here and in the now.
And the quote on the side from Carl Jung, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes, is to emphasize this point, that if you're just seeing nature as the source of solving problems, but you've got to go out to it, then you're failing to look inside to human nature. And there is this overlap between how we treat the forests, the fields, the mountains, and how we treat ourselves and how we relate to ourselves. And it goes back to that earlier slide where we were talking about Camille Paglia's ideas and Levi Strauss's ideas and so forth, that um, historically, where societies have been very fearful of and condemning of the wider environment, they've often also been very fearful of and condemning of the human body and the impulses and the needs and the urges of the human body like that Manichaean heresy that we mentioned earlier. The fear of one often goes with the fear of the other. And you could say by on the converse, a positive view of one is more likely to encourage a positive view of the other, which is an idea advanced in eco-feminism that um, a fear of mother nature often goes hand in glove with a distrust of women and a fear of women and a, a sort of um, misogynistic substructure to society. You could often argue it, there's also a lot of misandry, a hatred of men and the male body as well as hatred of the female body in a lot of societies and a fear of the body in general, male or female. There is a fear of the body in general um, and its needs and its urges and of course its weaknesses because bodies go wrong. And is there underpinning some of this at least a fear of death? Because to have a body is to know that that body is capable of getting sick, is capable of breaking. If you live long enough, it will age and become physically weaker. And your senses when you're 95 are not likely to be as acute as they were when you were 15. Uh, and so to be in a body is to experience vulnerability. It's an idea that in the realm of sociology is picked up on to a point by Judith Butler in some of her arguments and ideas uh, and the concerns that she talks about the precariousness of life to have a body is to have something that is even if you're fit and healthy and well not lying but <laughs> fit and healthy and muscular and athletic and whatnot nonetheless that body is not going to stay that way forever it's capable of being injured it's capable of getting diseases it's capable of you know having hangovers and throwing up and, and all of the, the various weaknesses to which flesh is air and is this fear of the weakness of flesh carried out into a fear of threats posed by nature which contains the viruses and the germs and the bacteria that can make us ill and not that not so much in modern day britain but in other parts of the world and in the historical periods contained animals that might bite us and rip us and tear us and so forth some parts of the world, earthquakes and floods and famines and, and environmental events that can hurt and maim and destroy on a grand scale. So a, a tendency to see all of these fears as interconnected, one to the other. Uh, another quote here from Eric Fromm. Uh, the danger of the past was that men became slaves. These days we would say people, of course, became slaves. The danger of the future is that man may become robots. Um, there is a whole school of um, thought within both sociology and to an extent psychology around transhumanism. The push to have um, certain forms of technology, computer technology chiefly, integrated to the human body and eventually to the human brain. We, we already have artificial limbs and, and uh, you know, various replacement parts for, for different organs and so on. But there is a push towards having more and more technology integrated into the body when the body becomes ill or damaged, but, and even for matters of convenience. So there are companies, um, there's some in France, some in America. I've not heard of any company in Britain doing it yet, but that, that's just because I haven't heard of it doesn't, of course, mean there isn't one, where staff are given the option to have an implant in their hand, a good microchip. So when they want to go and operate the photocopier or use the vending machine or open doors in secured areas, instead of having a little ID card that they have to hold up to the reader, they have the chip in their hand and they just hold their hand against the photocopier or the, the, um, the door or whatever it is, and it blips and lets them through. At the moment it's voluntary, 
and voluntary. I'm not sure how long it's likely to remain voluntary, whether we'll get to the point where companies start to bully their staff into having them or quitting their job and going somewhere else. Um, and will that become used in wider societies? Are you, instead of uh, the, having a card to put into your hole in the wall to get your money out of, maybe you'll hold your hand up and we'll all have microchips at some point. Um, at what point do we become less and less human if we become more and more cyber enhanced? And that is part of a concern within eco-psychology, um, the fear of the flesh and going back to Eric Fromm's notion of the necrophilus personality. He said that uh, people with that temperament are often very, very fascinated by machinery uh, and get on better with machines than they do with humans or with other living beings. Uh, he was dead, Eric Fromm, long before these kind of levels of technology that we have now were possibilities. But are we looking to a future in which people will become more and more and more in love with computers and robots and less and less in love with their own bodies or with other human beings or with the other creatures we share this planet with? Therein is a concern. Now, having mentioned death earlier, um, part of what we have in the biophilus personality and in eco-psychology in, in the wider sense is an understanding that death is a part of life. We are integrated with it. So as per the triquetra, that little um, interlocking pattern of um, Celtic knots up there, we have life, we have death and we have rebirth. In the natural world, things live, they die, and then new life comes out of the decaying matter. Those of a more religious bent might also think in terms of you know, things like reincarnation as a concept in Hinduism and Sikhism and so forth. But even if someone is very secular and doesn't go down that line, nonetheless, the, the, a tree falls over and dies, its wood rots, and the rotting wood feeds the soil and feeds future generations of plants and fungi and beetles and what have you. A new life comes out of death. It's the natural cycle. The, the, there is life, there is death, there is new life. And we can understand our own experiences in that sense as well. Not simply in terms of rotting bodies and things of a rather graphic nature like that. But we go through life, we have jobs, jobs come to an end, but there is life afterwards. We have relationships, relationships come to an end, but there is life afterwards. People often struggle very profoundly, sometimes to the point of self-harming, sometimes to the point of suicide, because they've lost a job and they don't think they will ever get another job, because their marriage has ended and they don't think they will ever find love again. They, they see death, they see an ending, and they see no rebirth afterwards. And so they kill themselves, or drink themselves to oblivion, or, or do whatever. Um, engage in a destructive activity because they see no future, no life afterwards. And the eco-psychology approach, and going back to the idea of therapies, is to emphasize that whenever there is a death, an ending, a cessation of something, life continues on. And sometimes it can be remarkably hard to accept that life continues on, but there is always something else afterwards. And so part of that therapy is the ongoing passage of life its continuance. Another quote on the slide there from Eric Fromm, to spare oneself from grief at all cost can be achieved only at the price of total detachment, which excludes the ability to experience happiness. So someone who is so afraid of grieving, of being hurt, that they refuse to allow anyone or anything to get close to them. They, they become cold and withdrawn and isolated. Yes, they will never feel grief, but as, as Fromm points out there, they will never feel happiness either. And going back to what we were saying about those decisions, those uh, the movement towards the necrophilus personality developing, being a, a series of, of, of external events, but also the decisions and choices we make, that is one of those big decisions. You get hurt, everyone gets hurt. What do we do about it? Do we struggle on and, and stay open to others and risk being hurt again? Or do we shut down, close off, become a little bit more necrophilus, and then a little bit more and a little bit more? 
do we turn into Miss Havisham from Charles Dickens dressed in, in our uh, wedding gown decades after the being ditched at the altar uh, and not allowed eat the food rotting on the table from the wedding banquet still there never moving on never continuing turning into this cold rigid monstrous creature that torments and abuses those around them part of eco psychology is it's not just about trees and plants and, and, and rabbits it's about understanding the natural ecology of the human mind of how it develops both healthily and where it goes wrong and becomes unhealthy now moving into environmental psychology a little bit more which we mentioned earlier puts quite a lot of emphasis as well as, as the, the, the wild environment it puts a lot of emphasis on the built environment and how humans use the built environment um, we have a module being launched next year as part of a new psychology degree which includes a whole um, module looking at environmental psychology which will be both the kind of green issues we've discussed so far but also how we engage with the built environment will form a significant part of that um, and, and so there'll probably be more seminars and, and uh, talks and so forth next academic year for those interested in these issues um, so some of the things that people have various psychologists have researched into over the years within the remit of environmental psychology is the impact of light natural light um, we know that people suffer seasonal affective disorder and one of the therapeutic techniques is to provide them with a light box with a, a, a bulb in it designed to replicate as closely as possible the effect of natural light because that has a, an impact on the glandular system which in turn has an impact on the hormones uh, that flood our bodies which can either keep us happy or leave us feeling exhausted and worn out and natural light has a significant role to play in that so we have um, research being done and well, has been done historically in factories which had either no windows at all or just tiny little windows way up high in the walls with, with no real natural light getting to the people who worked in those factories and what impact that had compared to parts of the factory where they redesigned the wall a bit to put in windows so people had more natural light could see out and they found calcium breeze um, the, the speed at which people work the efficiency with which they worked increased there were fewer people take, taking days off sick um, fewer complaints about the working environment because it felt more natural than working in this horrible boxed up lightless prison where the only form of light was electric light so there is a definite impact of having access to natural light in the design of factories of shops of schools colleges homes etc to to give people access to sunlight obviously particularly so in the winter months when the hours of daylight are that much shorter anyway um there, there's research into the impact of architecture and uh, this has a, a an interesting impact where the study of the golden mean which is to do with mathematical proportions of angles so when a, a room or a house or a building is designed the way the angles of wall and floor and ceiling and windows and doors etc how they marry up there are certain arrangements which are very harmonious uh, which pe relax people who live or work in those environments and there are other relationships which are very disproportionate and discordant and make individuals feel quite unwell quite nauseous to be in certain environments where it just feels wrong and weird to be in this distorted disproportionate environment we mentioned the impact of color the color that walls are painted or color of wallpaper can have an impact on people I mentioned that already um, personal space different which has a cultural element um, different cultures around the world have quite different notions of personal space some cultures people would like more space than they do in others so in some cultures people sit very close to each other in other cultures they sit more further away from each other uh, and that does also impact on who sits with who so whether it's family members friends total strangers um, and, a, and a lot of cultures are homo social which is not necessarily what it might sound like um, homo social sociality is where men tend to spend a lot of time socializing with other men and women tend to spend a lot of time socializing with other women it's nothing to do with sex 
Um, it, it's just who you tend to hang out with. And many, many, many cultures around the world, both currently and historically, have mostly been women socialising with women and men socialising with men and spending a relatively small amount of the day in mixed company. That's that's just the way human civilizations have tended to operate. And that can have an impact on personal space. So is it to the, the, the amount of personal space you want, if it's a member of the same sex if, as you, might be different from the amount of personal space you'd want if it's a member of a different sex from you. So there's cultural factors play a big role here. But the way buses, trains, buildings, etc. are designed has to factor in how much personal space do people want. And if the people designing these environments don't factor that in, they don't even think about it, they might be designing planes and trains and, and hospitals and schools and what have you in a way that makes the people who use them very, very uncomfortable. Either because they feel too boxed in or they feel too distant. They feel isolated and neither is good. It's finding that happy mean so that people feel comfortable. There's a whole area of um, psychology and also of sociology um, which looks at the way people use space. The, the, so how they will use, for example, a town centre, how, how they use shopping centres, how they will um, use college buildings or school buildings or hospital buildings or whatever in terms of the doors they use, the way they go down the corridors, where they sit. Um, where they take shortcuts and also the types of activities that people use spaces for which gets quite well I find it fascinating when it comes to looking at um, the use of geographic space for what we can broadly describe as rather disapproved of activities that could be crime that could be sexual liaisons it could be um, religious meetings where particular religions are um, outlawed in a, in a country or political meetings where a particular political party is outlawed in a country and so people will find spaces to use for things that they don't want the wider world to know about and there's all sorts of interesting studies done in that area which is something we'll look at on this new module next year but that again is all part of the, the psychology and the sociology of of the built environment of how we use place how we use the world around us how we engage now the quote you got there on the slide is from harold prashensky he was a big name in the, the world of environmental psychology and he's talking about place identity now place identity we'll go over a bit more depth in a second but essentially it's the way in which certain places are very very important to us as individuals like the place you were born or, or your home or the place you work in for example might be very important to you as an individual and forms part of your identity. And so Prashensky, when he's talking about this, um, in his quote, it defines it as a substructure of the self-identity of the person consisting of broadly conceived cognitions about the physical world in which the individual lives. So it's our understanding of the, of the physical environment around us, how we engage with that. And to give you a number of examples of this on the slide, um, a little bit, random examples I admit but um, as I talk about this you can discuss your own ideas and certainly in the the live version of this seminar people who are in the class are more able to give examples of their, how it apply to their own lives the places that were important to them so we don't have that kind of live interaction here but you, you can you know, maybe pause the video and think about your own place identity uh, so if we start on the, the top left hand side of the screen and we'll work our way around with the images. Um, some of you may recognise that building, that is Peterhouse College in Cambridge, uh, which a friend of mine used to lecture there, and he gave me a tour of it. Uh, at the dining hall, it's like going into the, the Harry Potter dining hall, it really is, it's quite um, quite strange, it's just like, just like that as a film set, quite fascinating. But if you go to, to university, or college or school then particularly if you spend a, a lot of your years in the same place and some people change school quite frequently but if you spend a lot of years in the same education establishment then that place can become a, a very significant part of your place identity both when you're there but also after you've left and so a lot of people have you know, university graduates have a lot of fondness 
for their alma mater, for the university they graduated from. And you know, might, they might visit it occasionally, they might go be invited back to events that take place there, that sort of thing. Um, for some of them, of course, it won't always be fondness. For some people, it will be a very negative experience. But it, hopefully, it's a very fond experience. And this is a, a point Prashansky emphasizes place identity isn't always positive. So it's sometimes places you don't like also form a significant part of your place identity, as well as places that you do have a lot of very fond memories and experiences of. So education establishments. And point we raised in the live seminar was that if you were sitting in a building that looked like something out of Hogwarts having a lecture, or if you're sitting in a building that looks like an aircraft hangar, um, the lecture might be exactly the same. The other people in the classroom might be exactly the same people, but the experience will be vastly different because of the building, because of the architecture, because of the look of the place. The experience of the place will change your engagement with the subject, with the other people, with your sense of self, whether you feel relaxed or uncomfortable or whatever. The, the built environment has this huge impact on how we learn. Uh, the, the graveyard there, um, obviously most of us will have relatives or friends or pets even who have died and are um, either buried or their ashes if they were cremated have been put somewhere particular. That place, the place of death, can become then very very significant for us. A place to visit, to go back to the grave, to leave flowers, or, or if you're Jewish you might leave a stone for example. You might engage with place in a variety of different ways. So it's places of death become a significance in and of themselves and acquire a sanctity in practically every culture on earth across history. The places where the dead are buried or where their ashes are, are poured become very, very important places that have to be treated in a very certain way, a very respectful fashion. And you know, acts of vandalism, people who go and kick over gravestones or spray paint them or urinate on the graves are viewed in a very, very negative light in just about every culture on earth. There is this great reverence for the dead. And certainly if we go back into history and still many parts of the world, um, whilst we're very mobile as a, a 21st century British population, it's only a short period of time ago that the majority of people lived in the same village or the same town that their parents lived in, their grandparents lived in, their great-grandparents lived in, and so many people could have pointed to the local cemetery and said, there's four, five, six, seven generations of my family buried there. And that takes on a tremendous significance of place when you have that much heritage associated with one place. Whereas if you move a lot, maybe you've got a, a grandparent buried in one city and another grandparent buried in another and, and some other relative buried somewhere else. There, there's not necessarily that linkage to place and that sense of permanence. The lovely cottage there is for, for those of the people lucky enough to be built, sorry, be born and live in somewhere as scenic as that. Obviously that would be a very easy place, I imagine, to attach to. Somewhere that's very, very beautiful. If, you, if you're born there or you live there, but equally you might be born or, or live in the tower block, somewhere that does not look terribly scenic, but that doesn't make it any the less significant to you as a place of identity, as, as a, a part of you. If you spend a large chunk of your life, whether it's living in somewhere very, very picturesque or somewhere plug ugly, it's still part of you and people will attach to it and get a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of who they are. Social class clearly has a tremendous impact here, which is where it branches into a bit of sociology as well as psychology um, uh, and the greenness the, or, or lack of greenness to the place the, the, the way in which you are able to relax or whether you feel tense and nervous in that place there's a whole raft of factors that come in with a sense of home and where you call home so not only the actual walls of your home but your immediate village or town or city community that you live in do you like your neighbours? Do you even know your neighbours? Or are you completely estranged from them? A um, whole raft of factors come into shaping that sense of identity. 
the very scenic view of mountains and, and lake. Uh, holiday venues, some people go up to holiday a different place every year, other people revisit the same place year in, year out and have favourite holiday locations or or maybe a, you know, a drive up the road to go hiking in the mountains, something like that. Not in Suffolk, clearly, but um, in some parts of the world. Um, so we can attach very much to natural environments if we've got a favourite place we love going to. To go for a picnic, to go for a long walk, to, to take the dog, to um, breathe some fresh air, just to, to get away from people, perhaps. Um, that becomes part of our identity too. And the, um, the, the standing stones of Avebury in the last picture, um, places of worship, whether it's a church, a mosque, a synagogue, a stone circle, a gudvara, or whatever it might be, some place of religion, of devotion, of spirituality takes in a tremendous part of someone's identity, especially if they spend a long period of time going back and forth to the same place. It can have a huge amount of significance from some of them, like Avebury, are places of pilgrimage for individuals to go to uh, and form big occasions in their lives. Um, they, they have a, a tremendous significance to the individual. Uh, and so all of these things, whether it's a place you live or a place you work or a place you study or a place you worship or a place you go to for walking the dog or whatever it may be, a place you bury your dead, all of these become significant places of identity. They form a sense of who we are. And a key factor in having this sense of who we are is how it impacts on us emotionally, psychologically. It not only builds up a sense of identity, but it can also, it's a two-way street. It can also give us a link to place, that we know that place. And we want to preserve that place, at least if it's a positive relationship we do if it's a negative relationship maybe not but um that that lovely woods where you walk your dog and if one day you hear that some supermarket is going to bulldoze it down and turn it into a car park you might be outraged you might go and sign petitions write to your mp chain yourself to a tree you might respond in a way that you would not respond to some other woodland that you've never heard of that you've never been to because that place is part of your identity um, from an eco-psychological point of view, this two-way street is as much about protecting the environment as it is about building your sense of self and protecting yourself. Because those who are invested in place, whether that's a woodland or a particular building, or your old college, your old school, the local church, or whatever it may be, you have an investment in place, you will want to protect that place. A place which no one is invested in is not likely to get much protection. So if somebody does want to bulldoze it down and turn it into a car park or, or whatever they're going to turn it into, then there's not likely to be any voices raised in objection because no one cares. And place identity is about primarily caring. The destruction of the place is a destruction of part of you. And the meaning and the sense of identity and the, the, the structure if we want to bring in a little bit of sociology and talk about Bordeaux and his notion of habitus, of providing structure and regulation to life, because you go to that place frequently, you, you work there, you live there, you pray there, you, you visit your grandparents' grave there, whatever it may be, it's a place of structure to your life. Um, that takes on a huge significance. And if it's gone, the structure of your life starts to unravel a bit you lose a significant chunk to the structure of your life. And the, the notion of place grief is also a factor here, that just as we may grieve for the death of a relative or a friend or a pet, if you have a favourite place, some, some building you absolutely love and one day it burns to the ground, or the, the woodland you, you like to go and picnic in and it gets chopped down, you can feel grief, quite genuine, real grief for the loss of that place. And you mourn it just as you would mourn the death of a person or of a pet. Because it, it is a significant loss in your life. And to downplay that, to dismiss it as nonsense, is a, a failure of human empathy. Sign of a necrophilous personality, I'd suggest. That you fail to recognise that for that other person, that place was a living presence. As much as to the ancient Romans talking about the Genius Loci, the spirit of place. 
in a more secular sense, that place had a living reality to the individuals whose lives were invested in that place. And we could certainly argue that for individuals, pretty much all of us perhaps, we need to invest in place. This needs to be a factor recognised. That just as we, well, usually love our homes, so you spend a hell of a lot of time at work or studying in the library or going to college or going to church or whatever it may be, you have an investment in that place. And a recognition of that by people, particularly anyone who may have a managerial role in, in the, the place you work in or the place you worship in or the place you study in, whatever it is, to recognise that people do value being in that place. Uh, maybe want to mark it in some way, celebrate it in some way, engage with it in some way is important. It recognises their humanity, their sense of participation. And this is something Schroeder talks about a lot, this idea of, of place attachment. To be attached to a place is part of shaping your identity. If you're never attached to a place, do you have a significantly weakened sense of identity? And arguably, yes, you do. Sad to say, but you, you may well have a, a, a somewhat damaged sense of identity because it's not um, forming those necessary attachments in the same way as if you never attached to another human being, you never attached to a pet, you never made any kind of an attachment. We would recognise someone who was very cut off from any sort of emotional investment in others as being a very vulnerable individual, a very um, damaged individual perhaps psychologically fragile individual. So the same is true of anyone who fails to make an investment into place. And maybe a factor of that failure to invest can come from a very transitory life, someone who's constantly moving, constantly on the go, never anywhere long enough to invest in it. So if they have a home, it's more like a dormer, a place they just fall asleep in and may as well be a hotel room for all the care they have of it. They're never anywhere long enough to really attach. And so they, they become a, a somewhat fragile individual as a result of that. Something to think about in more depth anyway. But uh, this brings us to the end of, of this recorded seminar. Now we do have on June the 22nd, a bit of a, 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 an advert here. June 22nd, we have our psychology and sociology conference. Now this year, um, we have decided for various reasons to do the whole thing as a virtual event. So there's going to be on YouTube, we have a YouTube channel, where we will upload a series of podcasts from different speakers. Some talking about psychological subjects, some talking about sociological subjects. Um, as a rolling series of um, lectures, so as soon as one ends, it then links you into the next one. That will be made available from 10am on June 22nd. Um, and it will be up there online for the foreseeable future. So if you don't have the time on the 22nd to listen to it, then you could listen to it the day after, the week after, etc. Um, and because it's a, a YouTube channel, you can pause lectures, go make some cup of tea, come back, turn them back on again, listen to the rest of it. Um, it'd be nice to get some comments and feedback, uh, positive, hopefully, or, or constructive criticism. Um, as to the nature of the subjects and the way it's done. Next year, hopefully, touch wood, um, COVID will be much less of an issue and we'll be able to go back to having live conferences again. But for this year, it'll be a virtual one. If you would like to tune in to that conference to participate in it, if you drop me an email and let me know, I will put you on the emailing list. And once the YouTube channel uploads are there, our speakers are in the process of recording their lectures at the moment. So once they're all uploaded and I've got the links, I will contact everyone on my email list to let them know what those links are. And then you'll be able to listen to these various different lectures um, at your own convenience. So if you drop me an email, that would be lovely. Um, and if you've got any thoughts or questions to do with eco psychology, um, I'm more than happy to answer those by email if you want to drop me um, a contact there. But this is our last seminar, aside from the conference, our last seminar for this academic year, but there will be more subjects next academic year. Some psychology, some sociology, some criminology. If there are particular subjects within that area, particular theorists, for example, or particular issues that you would like to know 
theory is about and research about, um, we're quite keen to know what the public is interested in. So rather than me just offering you things and the other lecturers offering you things that we're interested in, if there are particular things that you are interested in, drop us an email and say, well, can we have a seminar on such and such a thing? And we will endeavour as, as best we can to set that up. Um, either we'll give you the lectures or we'll hire in outside speakers to give you lectures on the subjects that you are interested in. But thank you for listening for that and um, look forward to hearing from you. Goodbye.